sort of dive straight in. Um, I, I feel as if Haskell's kind of growing up a bit. We've kind of gotten out of the very fact that we're here, right, with a, with a, a bunch of uh, hairy-chested developers. Um, is rather than uh, sort of pointy-headed academics, is, is an indication of that. This is uh, FP Complete's uh, website. They've rebranded their website as School of Haskell, which I think is rather nice. If you have not seen this, you should go there. Um, but I, I sometimes reflect on how, how it is that Haskell, Haskell's a rather ancient language now. How is it 20 some 23 years after it was first designed, it still has a fairly good mind share. In fact, if anything, kind of growing mind share. I don't know about user share, but minds anyway. So, and here, here, are, my, uh, here are my reasons that, that we've sort of stuck to a few pretty simple principles. One is purity, and you'll have heard a lot about that. Another is a simple execution model, right? So everything in this big complicated language all boils down to the lambda calculus, which you all know and love as functional programmers. Um, and the last thing is an exceptionally rich static type system. And that's what I want to focus on today. Uh, um, so, uh, why types? So, it seems to me that type systems are the most widely used formal method that we have, right? All of you use static type systems every day. Type systems are kind of uh, lightweight in a way so that you, um, uh, you write down types that are short enough for you to write and get in your head. But they're, type, they're, they're checked every time you run your program. So, they're kind of ubiquitous and machine-checked language for speaking about, um, about programs, and that's kind of important. So, um, so if we just to, I don't really want to get into a big uh, sort of abstract debate about why types might be a good thing, but I thought it was just worth summarizing some of them because they're, because they're not all thought about. The first one is the one that everybody grabs hold of, right? Why do we want a type system? Because well-typed programs don't go wrong. How many of you had bugs in well-typed programs, right? Well, type programs do go wrong, of course, right? They just don't go wrong in particular ways. There are certain classes of bugs that are ruled out, and that's very, very good, because uh, ruling out classes of bugs is definitely a good thing, so you should squash the easy ones. More important for me, though, that is that a type gives you a kind of partial specification of the program. If I say reverse as type list of A to list of A, I've already told you, and I do mean you, not the compiler, right? It's a way of communicating between human beings. I've told you something about what this program does, actually quite a lot about the program does. In a, um, so a specification, that is something that says something but not too much, machine checked, meaning we're sure it's correct, communicating to a person, it's if, I, if I read a program and it doesn't have type signatures in them, I say, couldn't you put the type signatures for me there? Because that'll help me understand it. And in fact, leads into saying that types are a kind of design language. People uh, used to say to me, they don't so much these days for some reason, what is the UML for functional programming? And I, was, and I felt very inadequate. I said, well, we, we, we don't seem to really have one. You know, you have this great UML thing, isn't it? And, uh, but, but then I realized that maybe types are it, right? Because what do functional programmers do when they start designing a program? They write down lots of type signatures and data type declarations. It is a language for expressing designs. And, when you, and uh, sometimes this goes quite far, like the ML module system. So, um, uh, and, and also, it's machine checked. That's also very good, right? That it's not a dead design that then sits on the shelf and gathers dust. It's a live design, but it's checked every time you compile your program. Types also are incredibly helpful for supporting interactive program development. This is something that you're very familiar with, all that IntelliSense stuff. You type dot and big um, lists of things. Where do they come from? They come from the types. And uh, so this is manifested most beautifully in, um, in IDEs for object-oriented languages and, and things that people have spent hundreds of man years developing. The functional programming community typically has been less good at developing those things, partly because there were quite a lot of engineering effort. But Don Simon and his um, colleagues have done a great job with F-sharp, and uh, I'm very envious of the IntelliSense aspects of F-sharp, and particularly of F-sharp's type providers, which if you don't, you don't know about type providers, you should. This is a great example of the way that types can sort of dramatically extend what you can do with the programming language. This is very much in the, in the way of do more rather than this part, which is kind of eliminate bugs. So it's di different flavors. And the last thing that I thought I'd mention is, for me, uh, personally, the biggest thing that I get for types is almost the maintenance question. GHC, though our compiler of Haskell, is, um, let's see, 20-something years old, and yet we, I make pervasive changes to the code base of GHC all the time. And the only reason I have confidence in doing that is because I make a change, and then the type system tells me ever, everywhere I need to change. It's a fantastic tool for software maintenance. One thing I ask my, the friends of mine who do Ruby or Python is, if you have half a million lines of Python, how do you make sure that you can make systemic changes on a 20-year-old code base? That's, uh, and their answer usually is, we have a lot of tests. 
Um, and that's a very reasonable answer. We have a lot of tests too. It's not, it's not incompatible with functional programming, for, uh, as, as we've remarked. OK, so uh, um, let's see. So th this is, I'm ne nearly at the end of my sort of opening rant. Uh, because I want, to get, I want to get to some detail. But the, so this is why type systems are good, but I also want to mention why type systems are bad, right? So uh, the main reason why type systems are bad is they sometimes get in your way, right? If you if you've want to write a program and you know that it's right, but the type system just gets in your way, that's really annoying. So here's an example. Uh, here's a sort of Haskell-like program that does um, what's length of integer lists. So here's a data type for lists of integers, and uh, here's a function that takes the length. But if I want a list of characters, I could duplicate all this, replacing int with char everywhere, but that would be no fun, right? We hate doing that as programmers. So what do you think? Well, we, well one thing we could do is we could just use a dynamically typed language, and there everything is easy. There's only one type called value, and there's some runtime checks to make sure you don't add integers to characters, perhaps. And then, so length now takes a value, that's a list value, and it reduces a value, that's an int in this case. And of course, you can just do, do the job, right? So that's, that's easy. But it's much more fun to make the type system more sophisticated. Right? So here the type systems become more sophisticated because, what? well, this is a list of elements of any old type A, and length takes a list of any old element type and gives you does that make sense? And this is just generics in, in um, F Sharp and Java. Now, so I'm going to show, in this talk, I'm going to show quite a lot of code. And uh, um, I would really be reassured if you would ask questions and make comments as we went along, rather than uh, wait until the end in a very polite way. Right, so I didn't say that at the beginning, because I've just been ranting so far. But now we're going to start to see code. So are we, co are we OK with this? Because if you get, if you get seriously lost, then, then things will go bad, and you'll have no fun. So far, so good? All right. So. The message I want to get from this slide is that um, if you have a type system that's getting in your way, one way to deal with it is to have a less sophisticated type system, that is, you know, move in the direction of dynamic typing. Another way is to have a more sophisticated type system. So here is my, the picture that sort of motivates my life at the moment. Here are, th th this big thing is all programs. This green area is the programs that are well typed. That is, that your Java system or your Haskell system or your C++ system accepts. This red stuff is the programs that you want to write. That is the programs that work, right? So the red here is good and green is just accepted by the language. So the programs you can actually write are the ones in this little gap here. They work and they're accepted by the language, right? Uh, these ones, are, uh, clearly, there's lots of programs that don't work, but are nevertheless well typed. Those are the buggy ones we discussed. And here, this is bad, right? These are the programs that would work if only the type system didn't screw you up. Are you with me? Right? So as type system designers, this is what we want to do, right? We want to make the type system fit this, this red patch better. And what I want to do today is to show you lots of ways in which we're sort of busy innovating in Haskell space to make this possible. OK? That's the plan. Now. Here is a sort of little graph of what's happened in type systems. So uh, back in the day, there was sort of simple types. This means sort of int and bool and possibly arrows, right? So think, think sort of Pascal type, type system. Then ML came along uh, back in the sort of 1970s with the idea of parametric polymorphism. That's what we saw here. This is the ML type system that lets you do this generics or polymorphism stuff, right? And that was kind of amazing. Uh, during a huge breakthrough because suddenly there was something which was quite intuitive but was dramatically more powerful. And then we were sort of on a plateau, right? ML dominated the landscape. Then Haskell came along. We did add type classes, which is a fairly significant. And then we, we sort of plateaued as well. But in the last five years, there's been a kind of explosion of stuff happening um, type system-wise in Haskell. And that's what I want to give you a sense of today. So in short, Haskell has become a kind of laboratory for crazy type systems. You know, if you want to see weird stuff going on in it, to make this happen, right, then Haskell is the place to look, right? So the, the, uh, the purpose of this talk is to give you a kind of sense of what's going on in Haskell land. I'm, I'm, I'm usually, I try to give talks that say a lot about a little, that is, that sort of do a kind of deep dive, because I, I find that more satisfying to listen to. But today, I'm trying the experiment of saying a little about a lot. I'm going to show you a little bit about several different type system changes that we've been doing in Haskell, and you, you know, could come to a language near you sometime soon. Um, and that's, uh, but but I, I'm hoping that you'll get something out of each of them. So you've got to be extra alert to ask questions because I may, you know, I'll, I'll just switch to something else pretty soon. If you, so if you get completely lost, please ask, right? And then we'll, I'll, I'll, but we'll make sure that we stop on time anyway. Good. Is, is, that, is that okay? That's our, that's our deal. All right. All right. So 
Here is the plan for world domination for Haskell, right? We're going to build on the, successful, uh, the success of types by making the type systems more expressive so that we can type more good programs without, and this is important, so this is one I need your help with, right? That type systems are partly good because ordinary people can understand them, right? So once we go past that limit, right, and, and everybody's brains melt down, then that, 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 that's bad. We can't do that. So, so here we are. Uh, item number one, type classes. Now, many of you will have seen type classes before. I just want to give you a quick description of what they do for, the, for those that haven't, and also because I need that later. So this is innovation number one, as it were, beyond, uh, this is beyond ML style parametric polymorphism and generics. Here are a bunch of functions that you might like to write. Uh, sort takes a list and sorts it into ascending order. Plus just adds two things, but it ought to be able to add integers and floats and doubles. In fact, anything number-like. Greater than compares two things. Show serialize or turns something into a string that you can display. Uh, serialize might turn it into a bit string that you could send over a wire to some other computer. Um, hash, you, know, you get the idea, right? So these are all things which you might want to do on values of many different types. Um, but the trouble is that, that, that it's not obvious how to how to write them, right? But particularly in a typed language, because you, but, well, because you don't know the type of the argument, right? So one way to do it is you can provide baked-in solutions, part of the runtime system, for some of these functions. So, for example, um, for this greater than thing, you could just say, well, the runtime system gives you greater than on every object, or it gives you serialize on every object, or it gives you show or on every single object, right? So you can bake it into the runtime system. But, and, and hashing, likewise. But that's a bit unsatisfactory, because it means that the designer of the system has to anticipate all the things you might want to do. And they're going to anticipate five of them, and you are going to want to do 500, I promise you, between you, collectively. So this is, this is, uh, this is kind of the um, uh, this is a kind of classic uh, solution. This is what Java and .NET do, for, at least for the functions that I showed you over the page. Um, then another thing you could do is to say, well, um, when you write a greater than b, what you really mean is, a greater than float b or a greater than int b. You know, if a was a float, that's what you meant. If a was an int, that's what you mean. So it's a kind of local choice based on types. So it's a kind of uh, simple local overloading. But what you couldn't then do is write functions like this one that say between a, b, c, a greater than b and b greater than c. Now, now do we mean int or float? Uh, now, so this local choice thing would say, uh, you've, got to, you've got to specify. You would have to say between works on ints or it works on floats, but it cannot work on both. See the problem? Right. So what are we going to do? Haskell's solution is this. So this is back in 1990 or thereabouts. We want to give functions that have this sort of quasi-polymorphic flavor a constrained type. And this has become, there's, it, there's something like this shows up in OO languages a bit these days as well. So we'll give square here the type num a, double arrow a to a. So you should read this as, for all types a, such that a is numeric, that is, a is a member of this num class or category or something, then I'll take a value of that type to, to that type. And then we can do similar things for sort and serialize and member. They all, they all have their polymorphic types, but it's, as it were, it's bounded polymorphism. For all a, such that some constraints on the type, we can do this. Does that make sense? Right? And so, at least at a, at a kind of in intuitive level. And then, um, uh, then are these, uh, now we don't want these things to be built in, right? That's the whole point. Look, I, d I don't want to have built in collection. I want to be able to describe new um, constraints on types. So, what does it mean to describe a new constraint? Well, so in Haskell, it's expressed by giving a class declaration. So, at this point, you have to forget everything you know about object oriented classes. This is actually more similar to an object oriented interface. Um, so forget about what you want to know about OO classes. In Haskell, you define class. This is what introduces the num class in the first place. And all you do is you, you say class num a where, and then you give the signature of the methods of that class. That is, the things you can do. If something is a, an, in, the, in the class num, then you can do plus times and negate to it. And then to make an existing type into an instance or, or member of that particular class, you use an instance declaration. So you say, this is saying int is an instance of the num class because to add to ints, you use plus int. To multiply to ints, you use mul int. I'm assuming here that we do have the, the sort of primitive um, addition and multiplication on ints already in hand. Does that make sense? So at least notationally. So the idea is at any time you can introduce a new class just by writing essentially the signatures of the functions that members of that class must have. Um, and then you can make a type 
even an existing type, not just new types, but even existing types, an instance of the new class by, um, by writing down essentially these witnesses that say, uh, say why it's a member. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? This is, this is a bit ominous because I, mean, I know you're all functional programmers, but I'm not assuming that you've all, all been using Haskell recently. Oh, how does it compare with traits and mix-ins? Uh, that is not a question that, that um, admits a simple answer. <laughs> I actually have a whole talk about this. But, um, but I'm, 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 so I, I think I'm going to decline to answer you <laughs> at this moment. Um, because then I wouldn't get, wouldn't get to say anything else. Yes, David. Beg your pardon? I think the answer to the question is yes. Yes. Has it, has it got to do with? No. It, they're, they're basically equivalent. OK. Right. So this is just the way it's packaged in Haskell. So type classes are not, we're, we're quite, yes, yeah, fine. Good. Now, uh, so that's classes. I'm going to use them a bit more later. But just to, just to say, at the time that they came along 23 years ago, it was, it was a lot of fun. And it, and it turned out this simple idea has ramified in all sorts of ways. Now, second thing that um, uh, is less widely, um, has been in Haskell since the beginning, but is less widely seen in other programming languages, higher kinds. So uh, here's the idea. Here are three map functions. So here's map over lists. So this, no, this, this, this square brackets means the empty list. This x cons x is means a, a cons, right? So colon, it means cons in Haskell. So this says, to map f over the empty list, I give the empty list. To map f over cons, I apply f to the head and map f over the tail. So that should be familiar, all right? Now here's a type, data type of trees. So a tree data type is either a leaf. Is this notation familiar to, to most of you, that it's either a leaf or it's a node with two subtrees? And then here's map. How do I map a function over all the leaves? Well, if it is a leaf, I apply f to the leaf, and otherwise I recursively call map. Right? Here's maybe, which is um, like an option type in ML or, or a nullable type in, in, what's it called in F sharp? I must have a name this time. Option, option, OK. Um, all right, so, how, so th the point here is that the map doesn't have to be recursive. Here, I'm just, uh, this isn't a recursive type. So here's a non-recursive map, it, but it nevertheless does the same thing. It applies f to the, to the leaf elements, right, here to the x part. OK? Now, what's the common pattern to this? Well, in every case, all these three maps, I've got a function and a, um, a poly polymorphic data type, maybe a here, tree a here, list a here. Right? And then I'm returning the very same data type with the A replaced by B. Okay? So I'd like to express that directly. And here's how we do it in Haskell. We want to say, um, so what we want to do is to say that, that lists and trees and maybes are all examples of a functor class. So here's the class functor. And in just like the class declaration I showed you, we, I'm just going to give the signature of the operations. And the operation is in Haskell, it's called, we, uh, is in the library, it's called fmap for some reason rather than just map. But there it is, fmap. So it takes a function from A to B and a something of A and returns a something of B. Do you see how that just matches the pattern here? The something of A returns a something of B. The something of A, is something, does, does that make sense? So at least at a syntactic matching point of view, I hope you can see that this signature here matches map list, map tree, and map maybe, with k replaced by tree, maybe, and list, uh, or in some order. Yeah? So uh, what could be simpler, right? We just, we just want to say maybe is an instance of functor. Just as we said int was an instance of num before, we want to say maybe is an instance of functor. Um, and the witness of the, the evidence that we give is that fmap is implemented by map m. That's this guy here that we wrote. This is a perfectly ordinary function. And, and it, right. Are you with me? Yeah. Witness. Oh, what do I mean by witness? So um, uh, in a court, what, what, what does witness mean? In a court, if, you, um, if somebody makes a claim, uh, right, you might then say, and we'll put you know, um, Fred in the witness box to, 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 as a proof that this has happened. Or, so, it's a, so a witness is a kind of some evidence that something is true. So if I'm going to claim that maybe is an instance of functor, then the proof of my claim is that I can hold up map m and say, look, right, there is a function that does that. And moreover, here it is. Now we said, so that, that's, that's the, thank you, thank you. OK, anybody else? That was good. No, silence. OK, so now, um, the point, have a look here. This k guy here. 
is now ranging not over types, but over type constructors. He is instantiated by maybe, not by maybe A, but by maybe, right? Or by tree. And what is this maybe thing or tree? They are type constructors. That is, maybe over here is the thing that makes a type. Given a type argument, it will give you back a type, right? So you can think of maybe as having kind star arrow star, where star is the uh, sort of conventional notation for type. Just the trouble is that type is an overused word in programming languages, right? And this K thing here, what is its kind? Well, here it takes a type. Uh, this, this A is a, is, a, um, is a thing of kind star. It is a type. And it returns a type because the argument of arrow must be a type. You see what I mean? So K is a type constructor. And it's instantiated by type constructors by maybe and list. So far, so good? Does that make sense? So, so in effect, the kind system is kind of keeping ourselves sane when we write down types. But this is a little weird, because now we've got things that look like type variables, this k thing, which now don't range over types. They range over type constructors, and that's unusual. But um, it's very, very, very helpful. So here's a, the classic example. Right, so you'll all have heard of, heard of monads. I'm not going to go do a monad rant today. But look at the, um, the monad class, right? Here's this m guy. And look at these types. Return takes a to ma. Bind takes ma to a to mb. So this m thing is plainly another one of those type constructory things. m has kind, star arrow star. And indeed, when we give instance declarations, we see that we instantiate m with io, which is has kind star arrow star. And maybe again, maybe as a monad too, as well as being a uh, functor here. It's also a monad here. And so we can instantiate this m with maybe as well. And, um, and here's, the, here's the, the code for it. So um, uh, uh, this, w this pushed us over the hill way, way back in 1990s, when we finally when we realized that monads were an instance, uh, a, an example that needed this higher kinded thing. We thought, this higher kinded stuff is just too good to miss. Now, is it just self-indulgent, though? Right? Is, is this just a cool trick? No, it's much more than a cool trick. Being able to abstract over higher kinded um, uh, type-like things, type constructors in this case, gives you access to a whole new level of code reuse. So here's an example involving monad. So what sequence? Sequence takes a list of monad-y things, monadic actions, if you like, and returns um, a monadic action of the list. So what it does is it runs these actions one by one and collects up the result. Um, so sequence on an empty list just returns the empty list. Sequence on a cons, uh, well, it first of all does A, that is this first action, and uses bind to collect the result. And then it calls sequence of A's and collects all those results and finally returns the list. But the interesting thing about this is that it's a function that will work on any monad, not just uh, IO, not just list, um, uh, not just maybe, but anything that is in the monad class. Rather like square was going to work on anything in the num class, and sort works on anything that has ordering. Does that make sense? So we've we managed to sort of uh, it, we managed to write one piece of code and use it in many occurrences. And when I showed you that very first example, length of the list, I said, we don't want to duplicate this code. Right? And our key to not duplicating was polymorphism. Right? And here, we are using polymorphism to avoid duplication sequence. But we, the polymorphism is over a higher kind of thing. That's the idea. All right? Now, um, uh, just to... Point. I've, I've, the examples I've used so far have involved type classes here as being the higher kind of things, but they show up in data types too. Let me give you an example here. So here's, this is rose trees, or these trees of various kinds. Now, a rose tree is either a leaf or it's a node which has a list of rose trees. A binary tree is either a leaf or it's a B node. This was an R node. Or it's a node with a pair of uh, bin trees. What's a pair? It's just two of them. Okay, now do you see the do you see the pattern here, right? That both of these data types look very similar, right? So you can imagine I'd write functions that work over rose trees and functions that work over bin trees, and I might write to I just have to, write to write, have one data type declaration. In fact, I can make them look make them look more similar by just re-expressing the syntax here. This syntax of list of rose tree really means the list type constructor applied to rose tree. If I write it in a prefix way, like I write. In effect, lists have a special status in Haskell. They, right, they get dignified with this distfix notation. But here it is in prefix notation. And this list type constructor, here at the type level, this doesn't mean the empty list. This means 
the list type constructor, the thing that takes a type and delivers a type. Right? So this, uh, ask a question if you're in trouble here. No? Uh, okay, all right. So, um, but you, do you see the pattern now? Look, if we could take this guy out, right, and make him a parameter of the type, now we could have one type declaration that did both things. Right, so here it is. Tree is now going to, as it were, combine both rows trees and bin trees. And tree is going to have this parameter k that's going to appear there. You get the idea? Look, instead of that and that, I'm going to just abstract it as a parameter. And now I can make rows trees by applying tree to list. I can make bin trees by applying tree to pair. And I can make uh, annotated trees by applying tree to and pair, where and pair does something else. Do you get the idea? So again, I've abstracted a common pattern, but the abstraction had to be over a type constructor, not over a type. Oh, so can I model a type constructor as a function that returns a type? Yes. I mean, of course, it, it is a function that returns a type, but it's not a, but it's a, it's a type level function that returns a type, so if you like. Oh, well, could you write a function, as it were, in, your, in the familiar language that returns a type and use it at the type level? Ah, you're getting into dependent types, which is very cool. Um, so, uh, in effect, the, we, at the moment, we, the, we started with a language that completely separates the world of types and the world of terms, right? The world of terms is where we write ordinary functions, and the world of types has this kind of special status. And then what we're going to do in this talk is to see various ways in which we can make those words sort of blur into each other a bit. Um, and so I'm not going to let you, I mean, you need, a, you need to go very far before you can allow arbitrary term-level computation to occur in types. That's called a full-spectrum dependently typed language. And you need a serious PhD, sort of two, more than one PhD. But if you're, no, no, if you're, in a, in, if you're in an ML language, you cannot get anywhere near this, right? Because you're just not allowed to write in types. You're just not allowed to write term things. Could you write it in terms of functions of return types? No, because the type checker, remember, that checks all this stuff, would then have to execute those functions. And it's just not built to do that. That's what gets you into the full spectrum de type dependency stuff. So, in effect, we're taking baby steps towards that in this talk. Yeah. You could do something similar with the uh, module system of ML. Oh, you could, you, know, you could do something similar with a module system of ML. Quite right. Yes. So, ML's module system is indeed a majorly sophisticated artifact, and you can do some of these things using that. But for this kind of purpose, that's a sledgehammer, or you know, like at a tactical nuclear weapon to open a matchbox. No. So it opens the matchbox, but there's a lot of other damage on the way. So. <laughs> but the matchbox is indeed opened. OK. So uh, let's see. Where have we got to? So kinds. So I want to give you, give you this sense. Kinds, that is these things that I've been starting to write at this, star, star, star. These things classify types in the same way that types classify terms. All right. So types, we say a term has a type. That's what I mean by classifies. 3 has type int. 4 has type int. So 3 and 4 are both in the class int, if you like. Um, and true has type rule and false. Has type. So types uh, glom uh, terms into, into groups, uh, as it were. And we can check whether a term has a type. And in the same way, kinds classify types. And we can check whether a type has a particular kind. And indeed, that makes, helps you to kind, kind checking type signatures. If you write down a type, like if here I wrote leaf, instead of a leaf A, supposing I'd written leaf K, you should all be going, oh, that would be bad, <laughs> right? Why would it be bad? It would be bad because leaf is something that is, you know, is going to have an argument that's going to be a value. And a value has to have a type, not a type constructor. You couldn't have a leaf that contained a maybe. It's got to be a maybe int or a maybe a or so, a maybe something. It couldn't just be a maybe, right? So the arguments to value functions have to be of kind star. So having kind star arrow star, which would be if k was there, wouldn't work. All right. Uh, last thing about kinds. This business about adding a higher kind, so, so the, this, this uh, adding, adding, allowing kinds with type star or star and, and uh, being able to abstract over those is the important thing here. Allowing that in, an obj in a language that supports subtyping, um, like all object-oriented languages do, is seriously harder 
than it is in Haskell because of variance. So if you've seen those sort of plus A's and minus A's in object-oriented languages, that's that the sort of variance is what's going on there. And it's scarily difficult. I believe, you may actually know this, David, uh, Martin was talking about taking higher-kinded type variables out of Scala because of this interaction. Do you know whether he has or you don't know? No clue. But no clue. It, it, I've it got is, to ask it, it. It is great pain. It, 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 it's scarily tricky to do this kind of game in combination with subtyping, and that's a conflict I don't know how to resolve. Okay. End of kinds. Yes. Oh, I'm out. yes, of course, I'm going to allow stars up the wazoo. Think about tree here. Uh, what type, what kind does tree have? Well, its first argument, it must be, it must be something, arrow something, arrow something. Right, because, it's, because tree has two arguments and produces a result. It's a data type, so the result, the tree, having given its two type level arguments, will give me a type back, right? So now, what's its first argument? Its kind is, it, it's the kind of k. What kind has k got? Star to star, right? So this is star to star. And a has kind? Star. It's just an ordinary type, right? So, OK, so, so here we are. So tree has this kind. And, and so in, indeed, I'm going to allow kinds that are, have arbitrarily nested arrows, right? So they, the arrows can go just as deep as you please. But the, but the moment they always have stars, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that too. So you sort of you get starry-eyed about this, but, uh, um, but the, the, there's, no, there's no limit to the nesting depth. Does that, that answer your question, right? Yeah, there's somebody, somebody at the back. Yeah, so is there any support for finding where these patterns exist? So, I mean, as you're going through it, it's fairly easy to see, oh, yeah, I can see that k's match and, and where the kinds get placed. But uh, particularly for people beginning this stuff, some tool support might be helpful. Does yes. the, the compilers say, oh, this looks like you could have used a kind here? Yes, yes. So, so some tool support would be helpful. And indeed, even as a programmer, you might like to write, um, and in fact, GHC lets you write. You can say uh, uh, data tree, and then you can say k with kind star to star. So you can give kind sign, and then a equals blah, blah, blah. So just write right up here you can give a kind signature. So just as you give type signatures for value level functions, you don't have to. They can be inferred. But giving type signatures is really good practice. You can similarly give kind signatures for, for kind variables. Now, even when you haven't done that, tool support like hover the mouse over the K and see its kind would be really cool. Yes. Um, and uh, I don't know about the, your su suggesting thing. But, but yes, just as the world of types needs tool support to help you navigate them, same with the world of kinds. So go, go to it. We're not, uh, the, um, GHC is a batch compiler, so it doesn't give you a lot of that kind of tool support yet. But it does let you write these signatures, and that's important. Anyone else? OK, yeah, oh, yeah. Yes, yes, in GHCI, you can, you can say colon k, and then you can give a type, and it'll t I'll tell you what its kind is. Just as you can say colon t and give, you a, a, give a term, and it'll tell you what its type is. So just the same thing, one level up. So indeed, that's a good question, because it, it, it signals that the, the, the idea is to make this appear simple, in quotes, by trying to reuse all the intuitions from the world of terms and types and reuse them for the world of types and kinds. Right? So it's meant to sort of feel familiar one level up. OK. Yeah. Oh, is there a level up from kinds? Oh, yes. So not in, not in uh, GHC Haskell, but there are languages that have an infinite tower of kinds, because kinds have sorts, and sorts have uh, boojums. And in fact, uh, you, since you want an infinite number, you tend to call them uh, the levels, you know, one, two, three, four. This is called universes. And, and, and yes. So omega, for example, is an experimental language, a real programming language made by Tim Sherd that has an infinite tower of these things. And uh, I always, uh, um, does Cock have an infinite universe, infant tower of universes? I always forget. Um, but there's, there's a whole, whether you have just one or an infinite tower is indeed uh, an interesting dimension for systems of this kind. But excellent question, because if, 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 types, uh, if types classify terms and terms classify kinds, what classifies kinds and so forth? Yes. Right. Okay. Right, how are we doing? 25 minutes to go. Good. 
Uh, ne next, next thing, GADTs. Now, again, G these are called generalized algebraic data types. Um, and they've been around in Haskell for about five years, I suppose. So some of you will have come across them, but maybe not everybody. So here's a very, very quick um, intro to GADTs. Here is some and the data type that we've seen before for the, the maybe type. But you're in GHC, at least, you're also allowed to write it like this. This just says maybe A is a data type. And we just give the type signatures of its data constructors. Here's the type signature for just. And here's the type signature for nothing. Okay? So it's, these are alternatives. They're equivalent. You can write either. Uh, both will be accepted. And then, of course, now that we know what the types of just and nothing are, we can type check these terms, and we can see what types they have. Right? So in some ways, this is quite nice, because the, this, is, this explicitly gives you the type signature for the constructors, rather than you having to figure it out in your head. OK? Now, um, here's a, um, uh, the, cla the, the classic example for GADTs, which is a little term evaluator. So here is a, the data type that gives you the syntax trees for a very small language. What is it? Literals, successor, is zero, and if. So it's a very tiny programming language expressed as a data type. right? So you can write it syntax trees. And here are values. But why do we need values? Because the eval function is meant to take a term and gives you its value. So if you eval a lit i, I've got to return what? Well, an, in this case, since lits contain integers, I've got to return an integer. So, but I need to wrap it in something, because sometimes I'm going to return a Boolean. Am I not? Because is zero had better return a Boolean. So the things that eval returns can be either integers or Booleans, right? So what do we do? We make a data type for it, which says I'm an integer or I'm a Boolean, right? So and here we have wrap it in vint. So far so good. What does successor do to eval successor? We add the closing brace and then we evaluate the term. It had better give you an int, right? V int, right? If it's a V bool, ah, type error in the original term, right? And then we add one. Are you with me so far? This is very should be this is just straightforward um, functional programming stuff. What does if do? It evals it, and it, then it should get a bool, and depending on whether the bool is true, and, true or not, we, we return one or the other. So far, so good? Now, uh, what's wrong with this? Well, um, it's kind of a bit of a nuisance, because we can, for a start, we can write L-type terms. And secondly, there's an awful lot of tagging and untagging going on here. And if the input was well-typed, we wouldn't like to have to do that. So here's the idea of GADTs. It's the single idea. Here's the data type of terms written down again, just from this data type, but written down by giving the, the type signatures of each data constructor. And here, I've generalized it a bit by saying term of A, right? So where the A here is now going to be an indication of the type that is returned by evaluating that term. So lit3 would have type term of int. Is0 of t would have type term of bool. And you can see that here. So lit takes an int and now returns not just a term, but a term of int. And successor takes a term of int and returns a term of int. Is0 is looking, is expecting an integer valued term and returns a Boolean valued term. And if is polymorphic, it expects a Boolean valued term. And two terms that can return a value of any type, but as long as it's the same, and returns a value. Does that make sense? Uh, well, these are just beautiful, perspicuous types for these data constructors. The, and um, uh, yeah, and so wouldn't it be great if we could do that? Because then, if these were the signatures for these constructors, I've written them out again here, then some ill-typed terms would now be, well, ill-typed. So lit4 would have type term int. Is0 of lit4, that's well-typed, because this is a term int. Is0 needs a term int and returns a term bool, it's all a term bool. But what about if of lit4? Oh, if takes a term bool, right, as its first argument, but lit4 is a term int. So this is just a type error. Right? And it's good that it's a type error, because if is not supposed to get an integer valued argument. Okay? So by giving the constructors more interesting types, uh, more expressive types, I'm able to reject, as it were, statically, uh, terms that are all typed. And that's good. But the really orgasmic bit is this. Look at this. This is the evaluator for um, these new terms. Uh, let's see. Eval lit i. Do you remember what it was? We had to wrap, we had to say v int of i, right? Um, but we don't need to do that anymore because look at the type that eval has. It takes a term of a and returns a a, right? So if it's an integer value term, it returns an integer. If it's a boolean value term, it returns a boolean. What could be more beautiful than that for the type of an evaluator, right? You're meant to sort of salivate at this point, right? Uh, and uh, 
So, and now, since, so, so look, um, if it's an integer value term, I get an int. So, a successor, I just, so since eval t, if it gets an, uh, if, look at the type of eval, if, it, if, if the t is a term int, which it will be, I'll get an int, which I can add to the one, uh, and, and things are good. But there is something fishy about this, isn't there? Because, look, here at the right hand side here, i is a int, right? That i really is an honest to goodness int. And yet, this function is meant to be returning a one of these A things, right? So how does that work? Why isn't this a type error? Well, it's because if I, when I pattern match on this lit, right, remember that here, this lit guy is a term int, right? So the only way that eval, the only way I could be pattern, if I see a lit, that lit must be a term int, right? Because look, lit builds term ints. So if eval sees a lit, then we know that A here is in fact int. That make sense? So what that means is that in this particular right-hand side, in the body of the pattern match on the lit i, we know that a is equal to int, and I write tilde here for type equality. All right? And over here, in this is zero thing, I know that uh, a will be bool, and that's why this equals equals works. So what this amounts to is that during type checking, we have to take account of local type equivalences so that, it's not that, so that in this right-hand side, a is equal to int, in this a, equals, a is equal to bool. All right? Um, yeah. Yes, corner. So i is an integer. Yes. But you're returning a term. So there's some sort of... No, no, no. I'm returning an a. I'm, I, I'm given a uh, term, and I'm returning... Okay. Uh, so, so if I'm given a term of int, I'm going to return an int. Yeah. Not a term okay. of int. Yeah. You're someone else here. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, good question. So here there's a term A, and here there's an A. There is no relationship. So this means for every A, and you could, you could use B here, or W, right? So that there's no connection. Sorry. So in fact, it's, it's somewhat unfortunate to even use that. And in fact, you're like, oh, what did I do? Oh, um, you can write data term of kind star arrow star. You don't have to write the A at all. So it's of no significance at all. Thanks. Good point. Acute. OK? That's GADTs. Um, and it turned out to be, this, is, this has turned out to be very, very nice, simple, simple, simple in the sense of um, programmers seem to get it quite quickly. I'm hoping that you do. Um, because all that we're doing, the only language change, sort of syntax stuff, is to allow you data type declarations in which the return types are not just term A, right, to allow more general return types. There's a lot of paddling under the water in the compiler to make this work. I wanted to give you one example of how this worked out in practice for one particular guy because you know is this just sort of the theoretical sort of self-indulgent stuff well um, uh, Henrik Nielsen uh, found it made him made Yamper go a lot faster he was building things called um, a, a domain specific language for uh, defining signal functions which are so you can think of SF as kind of being a, like a version of a function from A to B right so it stands for signal function so think of it as being a bit like A arrow B so he has um, this, this greater than thing is composition of arrows. So it takes a function from A to B and a function from B to C and, con and composes them to make a function from A to C. Th does that make sense? So here's the A to B thing, the B to C thing, and the connection is the, the A to C thing. That, and you, you think of these as stream processors. Now, uh, you don't have to read much of this code except to see that SF was actually implemented, this data type is implemented as a Real, real live data type, and it has some complicated representation inside that we don't need to worry about. But the important thing is that he found that he wanted some of his operations to treat identity specially, right? So he wanted to have a version of SF called SFID, which was the identity stream. That is, it took values of type A and returned values of type A and did nothing to them. And that turned out to be really important for optimization purposes. It meant this composition guy, because if you've got the identity thing on the left, and anything on the right, then you just have the thing on the right, and the same the other way around, right? So being able to pattern match on this representation to tell that SFID is different from the general version was very important. But look, SFID has to have a type that isn't just SF of AB, it has to be SF of AA, and that may seem less drastic than what we were doing here with term of int and term bool, but believe me, it's still way enough to mean you cannot do this in Haskell or ML uh, baseline to have these two things the same. 
And it turned out, in his application, this really made a big difference. This was the, I believe these are run times. And so this optimization, which was only possible for him because of this, the, because the type system was getting out of the way by allowing him to express more, really made some very big differences to his runtime. So I, I just wanted to point out this, this sometimes is not just kind of cool, it's also fast. All right, yeah. Yeah, on that, on that slide there, what is, I mean, perhaps I'm sensitive, but the SF, SFID, why aren't they the other way up? Because would not the SF match anything? And then oh, the oh, but you mean, oh, you mean, what, what? Uh, would it not? Because if you put the, the other one. You mean here top, or here? Yeah, up there. Oh, up so here. SFID. Oh, these are just but two data constructors. But wouldn't the top one always match? Oh, wait, wait, wait. So right. the order in which you declare data constructors never matters. Right. That's like in the data type declaration, whether I say nothing or just, doesn't matter, just or nothing. What matters is the order in functions that use it. Right. Thanks. Yep, am I over here? In the slide where you've got the code listed. Uh, that this one. part? Yes. Could you just read it out, assuming that your audience doesn't know Haskell at all? Oh, which, which particular bit would you like me to read out? All of it. Oh. <laughs> just, is no. It, no? Too no, I'll, I'll tell you in the break, okay. right, because I, I think that our, our time would not be best spent thus, thusly, right, so I should use the speaker's prerogative not to answer questions. <laughs> But it's an excellent question. I mean, it's actually not hard. I, I will read it to you in the, in the interval, but it's, but it's quite cool. It's actually a very, very beautiful paper. Um, OK? Uh, right. Now, uh, what are we doing? Yes, type functions. This is addressing your question about, could we have functions that maybe did something? Because these, these things like list is a type function, but it doesn't actually, it's a passive function. It never does anything. It's like a, uh, the maybe and tree and so forth at the type level behave a bit like data constructors at the value level. They've got a passive functions. So I want to show you active functions. Here's an example. Here's our num class, right, which we've seen before. Um, and uh, so um, remember we give a class declaration with the type signatures and an instance declaration with witnesses. Now, supposing I wanted to generalize it, right? So supposing I'd like to, oh, but it insists that when you do addition, you give it two arguments that have the same type. And it returns a value of the same type. So addition can add two ints and return an int, or add two floats and return a float. But what about adding an int and a float? Maybe we'd like to write a class like this that takes an A and a B and returns a, uh, I'm not quite sure yet, with the idea that perhaps when I make an instance for int and int, oh, this is multi-parameter type classes. I've just slipped by you here, but it's, that's no big deal. Right, so that we can parameterize a class over two types here. For, so if a and b were both int, then I could use plus int, and I'd be returning an int. If, if one was an int and one was a float, right, so the x is an int and y is a float, then maybe I need to convert the x to the float, use plus float to add it to the y, and now I've got a result that's a float. Do you see, you see the idea? So I'd like to apply appropriate conversions depending on the types involved. And now I could run these two programs. So this, again, is in the spirit of making the type system get out of the way, and you've got to do the right thing. Okay? But what are we to write here? Well, tell me. If I tell you the types of the two arguments, can you tell me the type of the result? Yes. And how would you do that? You would be writing a type-level function. That is, you give it the two input types, so that, you know, if I give it here, here if I give it int and float as the two inputs, the result would be float. So what I want to write is, is something more like this, that uh, genum uh, takes a, adds um, a and b and produces a result that is some function of a and b. And what is this function? Well, I ought to declare the function, and I'll declare it right here. So this declares that some tie is a type level function of two arguments that returns a type. Right? So, so you can see some type AB is of kind star. We need that. Um, we haven't defined what some t what the, the we haven't defined the as it were the, the equations for some type. We've simply this is like the kind signature for some type, rather like type signature for value level type. You with me so far? Just intuitively that I want to say that the result type of plus here is a function of the two argument types. Simple. Now, so now when I give an instance declaration. Um, so here's the instance declaration for int and int. Well, we've already discussed that when we take two ints, we're just going to add them and produce an int. So here's the code for the, code for the plus operation. Well, what does some tie do? Given an, two ints as its input, it returns an int as its result. Right? 
So I'm declaring this function, I'm, rather than putting all its equations together in one place, I'm giving the equations that define some tie in a scattered about kind of way in instance declarations. Here is the one for int and float. So given an int and a float, the result type should be a float. Right? So th th does that make sense? So I'm trying to, trying to give you the idea that just as, uh, so in a class declaration, we give the type signature for the class methods and in the instance declaration, we give a value definition for that method, the, the, the value witness, if you like, to use that language. And also, we're going to now allow you to give the kind signature for any type functions belonging to the class. They're called the associated types. And in the instance declaration, we'll give the witness for that type function applied to those arguments. OK? Yeah? Well, how do you mean by both directions? Oh, yes, you would. Yes, so this would, if, if you want, you'd have to have a separate instance declaration for genome of float int, precisely because the code for plus would be different, wouldn't it? Because the code for plus would have to say, add in float of x and int of float y. Right? Yeah, you could imagine something more sophisticated going on, but, we'll, but we don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So how does that work with... Um, with Modular computation. I, I mean, if you had in, in other units, another uh, equation for some tie. Yes. In float to int. Yeah. Where yeah. Does it, is it, is there is an error. Oh right. So what does this do to modularity? So so uh, particularly since some tie is defined in a scattered way, what happens? It turns out that the very same problems arise in existing type classes. That is, these instance declarations in the first place may be scattered, right? And uh, at any place where you have to use an instance declaration, you have to, there has to be a unique one that works. Right. Con what's a contradiction? Oh, if there's two possible results, it's simply rejected. Yes. Yeah. That will never, so, so when, so could this happen at link time when you link two things together? So no, um, at the moment, Haskell's rules, at least, or GHC's rules for instance declarations are that when you compile a module, you look at all the instances that are visible in the, as it were, all the modules transitively reachable underneath, and you make a choice. Um, it's important, particularly for these things, that, um, oh, there is a, there, sorry, and when you compile main, we're going we're gonna to see essentially the whole program, and there we must check that there are no contradictions, because otherwise you could get a type soundness error. So we do do that, yes. So it is kind of link time, you're right. I, I, yeah. Yeah, the, the back. Uh, can we make some constraint on the uh, return type of the sum type? So, so like saying that uh, uh, if uh, 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 given A and B are nums, I also want to have the sum type to be a num type. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yours is it because if you, in a collection class, uh, right, you might want to say if the argument type is, um, uh, if, I'm, if I'm looking at, a, at a, um, implementing a, a, a binary tree, then I want the keys to be in ORD. If I'm looking at a, at a hash table, I want the keys to be hashable. So the answer is absolutely. And you can play this same game in which the type function um, delivers as its result not a type, but a class. Um, and uh, so that's called constraint kinds. And I, I left it out of this talk uh, because this talk is not, is, not, is not even covering all the stuff that we've, we've done so far. But, but yeah, good, good, good idea. And yes, exactly the same. Exactly the same approach works beautifully. It's really nice. Yeah. From short to short to int and int to float. Can you go from short to float? Oh, if you so if you have short to int and and, yeah. and int to float, can you go from short to float? So this is, this gets into ambiguity, right? Because there might be more than one route to do so, right? Because if you had int to sort of wuggle and wuggle to float, so now can you get now? There's two ways you could get from int to float. Okay, yeah, I see. So, yeah, so the answer is, no, nothing magical automatic happens there. Because sometimes when, you, when numerics are concerned, you can do something magical. PL1 was an example of that written in very large. But here we're just using generic type system mechanisms. This is just one example of using type functions. So we're not very sophisticated about multiple okay. levels. And you can rapidly get ambiguity. You, essentially, the compiler will say, this program is ambiguous. I need, I need you to give me some type signatures to help me resolve which function to use. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, uh, where are we? 10.25. So I'm, gonna, I'm now going to tell you the things that I'm not going to have time to tell you um, because, I, because I really want to wrap up on time. But I just want to give you 
Um, uh, all the, the slides will be um, the slides will be uh, available, and and um, uh, each of these sort of topics has a whole little cluster of papers underneath it that you might like to read, and they're all implemented. So if you just download GHC, you can try any of these things. So my main aim today has been to whet your appetite. But I was consciously thinking I would much rather have a little sort of to and fro with you in the way that we have been having and run out of time than to finish the talk perfectly and, um, and but have you sit there like bread puddings. So you've done very well. Thank you. Um, I just, so, so, let, so let me, in, in sort of uh, race mode, just tell you the other things that you might like to look at if you look at these slides later. One is kind polymorphism. So we've talked about kinds, these starry things, right? But have a look at this data type here. Do a bit of kind checking on this. What kind do you think T has? Well, here are two possible kinds that it could have. Could, it, it could be that F has kind star to star, and A has kind star, right? In which case, if I apply F to A, I get something of kind star, and that's correct for the argument of a value constructor, OK? But that's not the only type T could have. T could have a weirder uh, kind like this. The first argument, F, could take a bracketed thing here, right? Uh, so this guy. Uh, that's the first argument of F, right? That's the first argument of F. It's going to be applied to A. So, so long as this guy and this guy are the same, everything will work. You see the point? Ha! Ah, we've seen this before, haven't we? Remember the very beginning of the talk when we talk about length int and length char, right? We said, I have to write the same code twice. Now, suddenly, we've got a data type T that we could kind check in two different ways, and we might need this way, and we might need that way. What we really want is this. We want T to have a polymorphic kind. Ha! Right? For every kind K, provided it takes a, uh, this guy, I better have kind K to star, and the second argument have kind K. So again, the story is, do at the type level the very same thing as you did at the term level. So I'm not going to have time to ex explain this, or to do deferred type errors. Um, but uh, I just want, I'm going to wrap up instead, because you're standing in a threatening way here. <laughs> so it's, like I say, it's been a kind of experiment in the hope of whetting your appetite. I've told you about some of these things, and there are quite a few that I have not told you about. We, we covered constraint kinds. There's quite a lot about reflection, higher rank types, and contract. It's just, and this deferred type error stuff, there's just a kind of explosion of excitement at the moment. Um, and uh, I'd really like you to have a, a sort of sense of what's holding it all together. So here it is. It's back to your question, right? We're c gradually, in little baby steps, we're making the world of types have a bit more of the expressive power of the world of terms in order to make it possible for you to say what you mean. Right? That's the goal, to make it possible for you as a programmer to express the idea in your head as precisely as possible. So whether the hope is that it's sort of sim still sufficiently, sufficiently simple and intuitive for very intelligent people like yourselves, but you have to, you'll have to tell us, right? So, um, of course, it has all... You know, it's all got fairly complicated, inevitably. Um, but I hope that there's, there's some, some kind of simple principle shining through. So actually, I'd be really interested in your feedback about some of this stuff when you start to use it. Um, so uh, I'd kind of just like you to leave with a sense that, um, this, that, that you shouldn't be misled by uh, simple type systems. Simple type systems really do get in your way. Right? The challenge, and it is a sort of open kind of intellectual challenge is, is really, can we make type systems that are sophisticated enough to allow you to say what you mean while being simple enough to be usable? That's the, that's the exciting territory we're playing in. Um, and so, and, 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 and so much has been happening recently that now is the time to take a look, I think. I think you might enjoy it. Are there any other questions or observations um, as I'm, I'm sort of wrapping? And we, oh, it's 10.29, good. Yeah. Ah. Ah, well. <laughs> oh, so, so do I know of any, any languages other than Haskell that are, in, that, are, that are involving any of these features? So... So, for
first thing to say is that languages other than Haskell have been innovating too, right? So I mean, F-sharp type providers is a great example of, of, um, uh, of sort of excitement in, in, you know, in, this, in this space. I don't want to suggest that Haskell has a monopoly on this stuff. In fact, there are some innovations that are happening there that are not happening. And, and, and you know, Scala has lots of interesting type innovations as well. So in that sense, some of, so, uh, you know, some of this excitement is happening in languages near you. Um, I think... I think Haskell has a, has a kind of, maybe partly because it's not widely used as a product language, it makes us much more free to innovate. For instance, even those higher kind of type variables just aren't in .NET, right? And so it's very hard to add them to a .NET language. So, so it, I think it, it's, it's going to be uh, difficult. The, 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 reason, the reason that the languages you like, F, F Sharp and Scala, are sort of uh, classic examples of languages that have brought immense amounts of innovation to your existing ecosystems. But there kind of is a limit to that. Um, and so it's a, it's a strength and a weakness. And Haskell, we're not we're uncoupled from that. Right? We have a weakness, then we're not really connected to the ecosystem, but we can play here. So I don't, it's not a very satisfactory answer. I suppose the most of the things that I've shown you here, probably not any time terribly soon. Maybe, maybe there'll be a paradigm shift, or maybe someone will come. I don't know. Maybe um, Vizzy Viz uh, will, will, will do this or, or, or something. Um, but uh, it, maybe, maybe it's a challenge. Can you go back to, to one of, of your first slides where you, you had the green and the red uh, areas? Oh, yes, yes. Um, at this stage, I have to use my ICT skills. Oh, yeah, do join Computing at School, the Computing at School working group. Type Computing at School into your web browser, and then click Join CAS. Very important. The, you said that you, your goal was to bring these two uh, areas uh, yeah. closer to, to, to each other. Is it really the goal of... Uh, of, of programming language design because maybe in this red area there are some programs which would work but which you don't want programmer to write maybe because they are difficult to read maybe because they are difficult to, re to refactor so it could be also said that at, at, as long as you have at least a non-empty intersection between these two areas it's fine your programming language allows you to write what you, you, you want and maybe you want to cut some parts of the red area and on, on purpose not because it's a a defect of the type you send, but because it's a good property. Oh, I see. So you may say there are programs here. Maybe they work, but they shouldn't. Right? They're they're bad well, programs. Right? They work, but maybe they are difficult to modify. Maybe they're uh, yes, to that's right. They're bad in bad in that sense. Yeah. Yes, m maybe you're right, but uh, but I'm sure I know there are plenty of programs here that are perfectly reasonable that type systems are just getting in the way yes. of. So yeah, may maybe we don't want them to coincide. And certainly, there's always going to be many programs out here, right? Yes that are perfectly type correct. There's no way you could expect a type system. But nevertheless, we can shrink that a bit, right? Because I think we can make type systems that um, express more invariance. For instance, a data type that expresses the invariant that the tree must be balanced would eliminate more buggy programs, right, when you screwed up your balanced tree manipulation. If the type system enforced it, that would, that would be good. But there's always going to be programs here. Um, I just hope we can shrink this area um, a bit. But then there's a... Yeah, I'm always I'm always cautious about imposing stylistic guidelines on, on real people. Yeah, Ben. There's, uh, Robert, there's a. You said it. Yeah, listen. You said at the beginning that um, Haskell's um, like a laboratory for type. In some ways, like a laboratory for type systems. Um, do you ever put things in, and think, well, we'll see how well it works out, and possibly take it out? Take it out. I mean, is everything here to stay that you've spoken <laughs> about today? <laughs> That's right. Well, so uh, to a first approximation, because it has this lab-like flavor, um, we're a bit cautious about um, putting things in, but mostly they have in practice stayed. One example that we took out was something called um, linear implicit parameters. Uh, that, that turned out to be a bad idea. So that's, that's one example that we took out. Can I think of any other type system innovation we've ended up taking out? Well, the implementation of GA, oh, yes, impredicative, impredicativity. This is where you quantify over polymorphic types. That's been in a couple of times, but it always ended up so complicated in the implementation and so hard to predict what it would do, that it ended up more or less taking it out again. So I'm still looking for a good way to do that. Um, so, but to a first approximation, because, because it's a research language, we don't feel too bad about having multiple ways of doing things and, and multiple competing ideas. Um, if you were doing a sort of industrial language design, you might think more carefully, I suppose. Um, but there's something wonderful about the, the Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom. It's very liberating. Yeah, at the back somewhere. So, I mean, it's not just a, 
um, a toy language though but people really use it so my question would be do you see an end to the kind of lab like nature do you see this I mean that you've made fantastic advances in the last 10 years do you see that the the sort of end of the road of working out how expressive types can be and having a language in which people can start to sort of you know be more concrete well so so one of the remarkable things that Haskell is now used for lots of people in their daily work and that is amazing and it's I think the, pl the place that's most most affected us has been in not gratuitously making releases that break things and it's affected us a lot in sort of library APIs and trying to be more disciplined about mod modifying library APIs mostly we have been careful to make sure that each feature comes with a flag that switches it on and off so that these new features should not hurt you if you don't use them and that seems to have worked pretty well is the um, is this sort of uh, kind of innovation stuff coming to an end ah um, I never can see very far ahead. I'm not one of these grand visionaries. I think probably the uh, one place in which there might be a distinct shift is, I put on the previous slide something about contracts. These are places where you might write down something that's a bit more sophisticated than a type, like something that says, this function takes something that's bigger than zero and delivers something that's smaller than its argument. Now, the type system is never going to do that, but we hope, might hope an external theorem prover can. So that's more likely to be a, a well-integrated add-on um, and it will feel a bit semi-detached from the language. Ranjit Jala's li liquid types stuff has been added to GHC these days, so you can get that from him. Um, that's one direction in which I could see a very, a completely wide open, completely new field, as it were, that would be of great practical utility that would affect that. So I think there's still lots of, lots of scope, actually. Lots of scope. And I, I mentioned that particular one, but it's in the area of statically checked stuff still. Um, I think this whole idea of saying what you mean and doing static checking is fantastically powerful for building really big software that lasts a long time. Okay. So, so we're going to have to wrap yes, things yes, yes. up there. But thank you very much, Simon.